Hello everybody, my name's Iman. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. Today we're covering our last and final objective for our General Chemistry 1 playlist. Now the focus of this chapter is valence bond theory and we're going to cover the following objectives. We're going to begin with a quick review of the concepts we covered in the previous chapter. This includes Lewis structures, resonance, and Vesper theory. We're going to highlight the limitations of these models to set the stage for our next objective, which is an introduction to valence bond theory. In this section, we're going to explore valence bond theory and how it describes the overlapping of atomic orbitals in covalent bonding. This discussion will also include constructive and destructive interference, followed with an explanation on sigma and pi bonds. Then our final objective focuses on hybridization. So when the overlap of simple atomic orbitals is insufficient to describe the properties of a bond, hybridized atomic orbitals are introduced. And here we're going to learn about sp3, sp2, and sp hybridization. Let's go ahead and begin with our first objective and start with a review on Lewis structures. A Lewis structure, also known as a Lewis dot diagram, represents the chemical symbol of an element surrounded by dots, each symbolizing valence electrons of this element. Now, here in these structures, bonding electrons are depicted as lines between atoms, indicating shared pairs, while lone pairs are shown as pairs of dots on individual atoms. The number of dots around an element corresponds to its valence electrons. Now, despite their simplicity, Lewis structures do not always effectively describe a molecule's bonds. One significant limitation is their ability to represent the actual electronic distribution accurately, and this leads us into the topic of resonance. Resonance occurs when more than one valid Lewis structure can be drawn for a particular molecule. These resonance structures, they represent the same arrangement of atoms, but they differ in the specific placement of electrons, and they're indicated by a double-headed arrow between them. Now, the actual electronic distribution in the molecule is going to be a hybrid of all the possible resonance structures, meaning that the real structure of the molecule is a blend of these forms. Now, this concept helps explain phenomena that cannot be captured by a single Lewis structure alone. And while Lewis structures and resonance provide insights into the bonding and electron distribution, they do not suggest the actual geometric arrangement of atoms in a molecule. Now to address this limitation, we use Vesper theory. Vesper theory stands for valence shell electron pair repulsion theory and it utilizes Lewis structures to predict the molecular geometry of covalently bonded molecules. According to this theory, the three-dimensional arrangement of atoms around a central atom is determined by the repulsions between bonding and non-bonding electron pairs in the valence shell of the central atom. Now, these electron pairs arrange themselves as far apart as possible to minimize repulsive forces, thereby determining the shape of the molecule. Now, the primary limitation of Vesper theory is that it does not provide information about the nature or formation of chemical bonds. It only predicts molecular shapes based on electron pair repulsions. Additionally, Vesper theory does not account for the actual electron distribution or the dynamic nature of electron clouds. Now, these limitations necessitate the use of valence bond theory which offers a more detailed understanding of bonding by actually describing how atomic orbitals overlap to form covalent bonds. And this leads us into our second objective where we're going to talk about valence bond theory. 
As a friendly reminder, atomic orbitals are regions around an atom where electrons are likely to be found, and these orbitals have specific shapes, such as the spherical s orbitals and the dumbbell-shaped p orbitals, which are crucial because they determine the distribution of electrons in atoms, and they influence the electronic and reactive properties of atoms. Now, according to valence bond theory, covalent bonding occurs when atomic orbitals from two atoms overlap, allowing the electrons to be shared between the atoms. Now, when electrons are considered as waves, their interactions can result in either constructive interference or destructive interference. Constructive interference occurs when electron waves are in phase, producing a wave with a larger amplitude, leading to bonding orbitals. This increased electron density between the nuclei stabilizes the bond. On the other hand, destructive interference occurs when electron waves are out of phase, producing a node leading to an anti-bonding orbital. In this case, the electron density between the nuclei is reduced, destabilizing the bond. Therefore, valence bond theory states that bonds result from the constructive interference of electron waves. Now, when two atoms bond, to form a compound, their atomic orbitals interact to form molecular orbitals. A molecular orbital describes the probability of finding bonding electrons in a given space. This formation is qualitatively described by the overlap of two atomic orbitals. The greater the overlap, the stronger the bond. Now here, the signs of the lobes of these orbitals, positive and negative, they're assigned mathematically. We don't have to worry about that all too much, but they do play a crucial role in bonding. If the phases, the signs of the two overlapping atomic orbitals are the same, a bonding orbital forms. And if the phases are different, an anti-bonding orbital forms. Now, there are two main patterns of overlap observed in the formation of molecular bonds that we need to be concerned about in general chemistry one. The first one is sigma bonds. A sigma bond occurs when the electron density is concentrated along the internuclear axis. When, over, when orbitals overlap head to head, a sigma bond is formed. Sigma bonds allow for free rotation about their axis because the electron density of the bonding orbital is just a single linear accumulation between the atomic nuclei. Single bonds are sigma bonds resulting from the overlap of s orbitals, p orbitals, or even an sp orbital. A sigma bond is a bond in which the electron density is concentrated along the internuclear axis. Okay, what about pi bonds? Pi bonds form when, or, uh, when orbitals overlap in a way that there are two parallel regions of electron density located above and located below the internuclear axis. Pi bonds, they do not allow for free rotation because, because the electron densities of the orbitals are parallel and they can't be twisted to allow continuous overlapping. Now, double bonds, they consist of one sigma bond and one pi bond, while triple bonds consist of one sigma bond and two pi bonds. Now, a quick hack to determine if a bond is a sigma or a pi bond, draw a line connecting the two nuclei, kind of like you see here in this figure, all right? If the electron density is concentrated along the line, it's a sigma bond, and if the electron density is located above and below the line, then it is a pi bond. Now, this understanding of orbital and bonding allows us to refine our knowledge of bond types. So here, that what's important to know is that a single bond is a sigma bond. A double bond consists of one sigma bond and one pi bond, and a triple bond consists of one sigma bond and two pi bonds. Now let's go ahead and tackle a practice problem. Consider the bond between hydrogen and fluorine. 
According to the Lewis structure model, a bond between hydrogen and fluorine forms because it allows both atoms to obey the octet rule. The valence bond theory model focuses on an atom's valence electrons, which are 2s2, 2p5 for fluorine. Now, the only singly occupied atomic orbital in fluorine is actually one of the 2p orbitals. In order to have maximum overlap with the singly occupied 1s orbital on hydrogen, the 2p orbital needs to lie on the internuclear axis. Like you see here, here's our 1s orbital, here's that 2p orbital that has a single electron. In order for this to have maximum overlap, all right, the p orbital needs to lie on the internuclear axis. Now, in order to describe this bond, then, we have to determine whether it is now a sigma or a pi bond. So let's focus on how we define this. If a line is drawn connecting the two nuclei and the electron density is concentrated on that line, then it is a sigma bond. Therefore, the valence bond theory description of this bond is that it is formed by the overlap of a 1s orbital on hydrogen and a 2p orbital on fluorine, and it forms a sigma bond. Now, what we want to do is move into our third objective. While valence bond theory provides a useful framework for understanding covalent bonding, it sometimes fails to accurately predict molecular geometries and the equivalent nature of bonds. This is because valence bond theory assumes that bonds are formed by the overlap of unhybridized atomic orbitals, and this can lead to some incorrect assumptions. Now, to address these discrepancies, we introduce the concept of hybridization. Hybridization is a theoretical model that involves the mixing of atomic orbitals to form new equivalent hybrid orbitals. And these hybrid orbitals can then overlap to form bonds that accurately reflect the observed geometries and bond characteristics. Now this will make sense as we work through it. So let's start with first discussing sp3 hybridization and our example molecule here is going to be methane, CH4. Here we see the structure and the electronic configuration for carbon. What we notice when we draw out the electron configuration is that there are two unpaired electrons. Now, this electron configuration cannot explain methane where the carbon atom has four separate carbon-hydrogen bonds. And it doesn't make sense because when we look at the electron configuration, there's only two unpaired electrons. That means it should only be able to form two bonds. Okay, well, why is it that it forms four bonds? How do we solve this problem? Well, this problem was solved in the 1930s by Linus Pauling, who suggested that the electronic configuration of the carbon atom in methane doesn't necessarily have to be the same as the electronic configuration of a free carbon atom. Specifically, Pauling mathematically averaged or hybridized the 2s orbital, and the three 2p orbitals giving four degenerate orbitals, atomic orbitals. All right, let me say that again. He hybridized the 2s and the three 2p orbitals to give four degenerate hybridized atomic orbitals. Now, the hybridization process, it does not represent a real physical process that the orbitals undergo. Rather, this is a mathematical procedure that is used to arrive at a satisfactory description of the observed bonding. Now, this process gives us four orbitals, four orbitals that were produced by averaging that 1s orbital and the 3p orbitals, and therefore we refer to these atomic orbitals as sp3 hybridized orbitals. These orbitals have 25% s character and 75% p character.
Now, if we use these hybridized atomic orbitals to describe the bonding of methane, we can successfully explain the observed geometry of the bonds because there are four unpaired electrons in these four sp3 hybridized atomic orbitals. And now it makes sense that carbon forms four separate bonds to four different hydrogens. Now let's consider sp2 hybridization and our example molecule here is ethylene. So this, this structure of this compound has a double bond between the two carbons and each carbon is also bonded to two different hydrogens. Now, a satisfactory model for explaining this geometry can be achieved by the mathematical maneuver of hybridizing the S and P orbitals of the carbon atom to obtain hybridized atomic orbitals here as well. Now, when we did this procedure earlier to explain sp3 hybridization and to explain the bonding in methane, what we did was we hybridized the S orbital and all three P orbitals to produce four equivalent sp3 hybridized orbitals. However, in the case of ethylene, each carbon atom only needs to form bonds with three atoms, not four. Therefore, each carbon atom only needs three hybridized orbitals. So in this case, we're going to mathematically average the S orbital, all right, and then two out of the three P orbitals. The remaining P orbital is going to remain unaffected by our mathematical procedure. And the result of this mathematical operation is a carbon atom with one P orbital. All right, we keep that P orbital, but now it has three sp2 hybridized orbitals. And that means, all right, that the, these sp2 hybridized orbitals indicate that they were obtained by averaging one s orbital and two p orbitals. And it's really important to note that the remaining p orbital is not affected because in this molecule, there is a double bond between the two carbon atoms and a double bond is characterized as having one sigma bond and one pi bond. And that pi bond is happening between the unaffected p orbitals of the carbon that we did not touch. All right, finally, we want to also discuss sp hybridization. And we're going to consider the bonding structure of a compound that has a triple bond like acetylene here. Now, a triple bond is formed by sp hybridized carbon atoms. So to achieve sp hybridization, one s orbital and one p orbital, all right, are mathematically averaged together, leaving the other two p orbitals unaffected. By this mathematical operation. So then as a result, an sp hybridized carbon atom has two sp orbitals, has two sp orbitals, and then it has its two normal unaffected p orbitals. Now the two sp hybridized orbitals are available to form sigma bonds, and the two p or orbitals that are left are available to form pi bonds. And remember, a triple bond between two carbon atoms, there's going to be one sigma bond, two pi bonds. That's how we defined triple bonds. All right. Now the pi bond, the, the sigma bond results from the overlap of the sp orbitals, while each of the two pi bonds results from the overlapping p orbitals that were not touched in the process of hybridization. All right, so with that, we've covered sp3 hybridization, sp2 hybridization, and sp hybridization. And that is the last topic for this chapter. And with that, we've concluded our General Chemistry 1 playlist. I truly hope that this playlist was helpful. I hope this chapter was helpful. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, leave them down below or feel free to reach out to me. I will try my best to get back to you as soon as possible. Other than that, good luck, happy studying, and have a beautiful, beautiful day.